Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. We've been going through uh, my book, End Times by the Church Fathers, and looking at just the general idea of the end times from them. And then we're seeing that they have a few interesting little things to add. And our idea behind this is not that they are authoritative, but just like you would check with a lot of the guys that you know to be really good Bible scholars and see, do most of them believe in a whatever? And if so, why? What scriptures do they use? And in this case, if you have people that were direct, directly taught by the apostles, or in the case of what we're doing, it's like one or two generations down from the apostles. Uh, it's interesting, especially when they say, well, I asked John or Polycarp or somebody, and they said it was like this, but the consistency. So when you ask, like, do the, uh, what do they believe about the end times? Uh, do the gifts still continue? How do you get saved? Could you lose yourself? All those different things that we talk about. If the first century church fathers that knew the apostles and then into the second and third generations all taught the exact same thing. And then after the persecutions, when new people arise that haven't been trained thoroughly, that and only by that time do you have different opinions. You know, and if somebody was to say, no, Jesus taught me such and such, you would immediately be attacked as a heretic. And so it's interesting to see that. And that's very comforting because we can see that, especially like what we're doing these days is looking at the scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls, and seeing what the first century BC believers believed, the New, the New Testament for the first century, and then what we're doing here, the last half of the, sec the first century and the second century and going forward. And if we see consistency, that's really cool. And so uh, it, it's interesting to see all of those things take place. The fact that everybody believed in a uh, one God that's manifested in three persons. Messiah is God incarnate. They all, all said that over and over. And so we've been looking at the um, basic outline of uh of uh, uh the um end times so let's go to this and uh let me back up here this is the book end times by the ancient church fathers make sure it's even here there we go and in here we went through we went through an introduction which talked about uh, the people that we were doing uh irenaeus and let me let's see if i can do this again here let me rotate this here we go and then run it down a little bit. There we go. So in this case, we have Peter, Paul, and John. And Clement of Rome says that he studied under all of those. And Clement wrote an epistle to the Corinthians. So that's pretty interesting to look at. Not that it necessarily has a lot of prophecy, but just it's an epistle. And then you've got John, who has two people, Polycarp and Ignatius. And Polycarp and Ignatius write and do things in his time period some people say that ignatius actually uh john outlived ignatius john's writing uh the book of revelation in 95 to 96 a.d from the island of patmos and ignatius has already been executed but ignatius though disciple of john writes at least seven epistles to different churches so they have some interesting things in them Polycarp then has two disciples, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. Irenaeus mentions that he studied under Polycarp and occasionally saw John. So he didn't, he wasn't really a disciple of John, uh, but a disciple of Polycarp that occasionally saw John. So it's interesting to see that. And then one of Justin Martyr's famous uh, disciples was Tashian, and he became a heretic. So that's a discussion for another day. But Irenaeus' two main disciples were Caius and Hippolytus. And Hippolytus is the one we've been looking at recently. Uh, lots of interesting information. Caius is a fascinating guy to study, too. And then with Mark, you've got Pentheus, Clement of Alexandria, Jerome, I mean, uh, Origen, Gregory, going up the list. But mainly we would be interested in Pentheus. Uh, not so much Clement of Alexandria. That gets you around 200s. So we really want to stay in the first century, you know, like 50 to 150 people in that area, what they're writing, what they're talking about. And then Paul, we've got a guy named Mathetes and stuff like that. So these are the guys we're talking about. 
We haven't mentioned much about Polycarp, but I intend to bring that out. One thing, most of these guys have martyrdoms. So there's a there's an ancient church work called the Martyrdom of Polycarp. I think there's the Martyrdom of Ignatius, Martyrdom of several of these guys. Justin Martyr's account, that's, that's how he got his last name. He was one of the, the martyrs. And the martyrdom, if you've ever read Fox's book of martyrs, is interesting. But it's basically people sticking it out for the Lord. They're going to follow the Lord no matter what. And that's encouraging and a little gross, you know, about the modes of death and stuff. But usually they don't have much in the way of doctrine. So what are they standing up for? Well, Jesus. Well, what did Jesus say? Why is there a problem? Well, the doctrinal part's important. So if you set the martyrdoms aside, we have, for instance, with Polycarp, he wrote an epistle to Philippi in which he quotes a lot of Paul's stuff to the Philippians and some of Peter's and kind of explains some things as we go on. So he's, you know, 40, 50 years later after Philippians, but it's really interesting to see that. So Clement has another epistle to Corinth so we can see if they ever straightened up or not. Polycarp has a great epistle to um, Philippi. Ignatius has epistles to like Romans, uh, Magnesians, Trellians, uh, several places like that. Ephesians, so he wrote, wrote to Ephesus. So some really interesting things. <clears throat> anyway, we'll get to these eventually. What I want to do is pull these little things together. Some of these are as small as, say, like Galatians. You could print out Galatians on like two pieces of paper. So, but it's really worth having and studying. So some of these are fairly big, others are fairly small. But we'll get to some of these later. But now let me flip this back around so we can uh, do this. There we go. All right, and then run it up a little bit. Put it back to where it goes. And kind of, okay. So anyway, uh, and I, we explain this in here, but when we get to uh, this basic teaching here under the introduction, we have, and we went through this, this is just a real brief um, explanation. There was several church fathers that talked about the idea of there being 6,000 years of human history and then the millennial reign. And if they're right, and they tend to have different numbers, so we can't really use that to pinpoint the second coming or anything, but the, the concept is there. So they were talking about from the first century, basically 2,000 years later, we have um, a millennial reign. A lot of people are noticing that 32 AD plus 2,000 years is 2032, and that's about nine nine or ten years from now. Right? Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. We're in the era of probably when the second coming is going to be. Now, some people have it, not that, but the end of the age when the temple was destroyed. So there's lots of ideas and we can't really speculate unless there's something more to go on than, hey, this happened. So this plus that 2,000 years is what? That's just wild speculation. One of those is going to be right one of these days. But anyway, so the concept is clearly taught and that's what we were looking at. And we quoted uh, Epistle of Barnabas, uh, Reneas, Hippolytus, Commodius, Victor, uh, several of the guys talking about that. Then we went down and looked at first century AD teachings, and they basically were talking about things like premillennialism, the idea that the, the second coming and the millennial reign of Christ being a thousand years is literal. Now, later on, things get confused and we become amillennial. And Eusebius, the father of church history, actually records how it happened. Uh, the Gnostics were teaching weird stuff. And everybody was beginning to allegorize everything. And he wrote a book called, he was an Egyptian priest in, wow, let me think, fourth century, I think, somewhere in there. Um, but he wrote a book called Refutation of the Allegorists, people that try to say this really means something else. And he tried to explain how, no, it's literal. There's a literal thousand year reign. It's what we've always been taught. This is the way it is. And people thought he was trying to revive Gnosticism. It's a long story, but there's a there's a reason for it. But it really flipped over um, everything. And we became amillennial and stayed amillennial for well over a thousand years until like the 1200s, 1300s, people started reading the scriptures and deciding, hey, this is not correct, you know. 
Anyway, so this is some of the things that they talked about. We looked at Justin Martyr, about the thousand-year reign, the seven-year tribulation, things like that. And then we looked at Irenaeus's end-time teaching. And in there with his, we basically saw that he was premillennial. He believed in a pre-trib rapture. He made that very clear. And the, the thing I've been I've been trying to say is that when you look at this and they say something like the rapture occurs, the catching away occurs before the tribulation. Some people say, well, what is the tribulation? Is it a seven year period or a th the last three and a half? Depending on how they are saying that, they might be mid-trib or pre-trib or whatever. So we want to be thorough with it. And last week we went through one of Hippolytus's books and he explained that the, the tribulation is a seven year period divided into two sets of three and a half. And in the middle is when the, the two witnesses are killed, the abomination of desolation is set up. Same thing that Paul said. So we know by definition, their idea of the tribulation period is that seven year period. And the great tribulation, if they talk about that, is the extreme part of it, which is the last half. So if that's how they define it and they say the rapture is pre-trib, uh, it's pre-trib, not pre-wrath. So or mid-trib or whatever. So anyway, it's not important. They're not in authoritative. But what we're learning is that the early church had a consistent teaching which may or may not be correct, but it is interesting if these guys got this stuff they say from the apostles. And nobody in their time period would say, whoa, you're a liar, because I talked to John and he told me something different. And some people say, well, it's been doctored up by the Catholic Church. They've made it to be this way. Well, the Catholic Church doesn't believe this stuff. And in other places, when we look at it, they are extremely anti what we would consider modern day Roman Catholicism. So there's no way that a group would say, let's doctor up this that has nothing to do with my teachings. And right here where they're saying, I'm a heretic, let's just leave that alone. No, you'd be doctoring that part up, you know. So there's a lot of internal evidences for this stuff. Um, anyway, so the end time beginning in 1948 when Israel comes back. So things like that, the division of the Roman Empire. And then we went to, from Irenaeus, we went to uh, Ephraim, Ephraim rather, and he talked about Rome being divided, the rise of the ten nations, the Antichrist, the first and half sets of the tribulation periods, three and a half years each, so that's a seven-year period, that kind of stuff. And then last week, we looked at Hippolytus' work called On the Antichrist. And we're not going through everything in detail, but what we wanted to show from that was, number one, that Daniel's, the concept that we have from Daniel is the same. And also that he's a premillennial. There's a seven-year period with two, two halves. There's a literal Antichrist, and there's a rebuilt temple, and there's a rapture, you know. And he he's probably one of the, uh, or Ephraim, rather, was one of the clearest of the pre-trib, but we saw that Hippolytus was also. And then um, several things like that. So today what I want to do is focus on this one, which is another book by the same guy, Hippolytus. So we've looked at the people in general, just a few fragments of what they talked about, the second coming and stuff. And then we looked at Irenaeus because he, he wrote about it in several places. And then we looked at Ephraim's book on the end times or the, the end times and then Hippolytus work, the Antichrist. And so we touched on prophecy, but mainly focused on what the Antichrist is going to do and be and things like that in that last seven years prior to the second coming. Now, today, this is Hippolytus' work called On the End of the World. So it's another prophecy book, but it's not going to be focusing specifically on the Antichrist, but other things. But there's a lot of the actually the exact same teaching in there. So what I want to do is focus on two things. First, I want to show you the same concept with Daniel, and I want to pull up our website here. So this is our prophecy charts on our Bible Facts Network. But again, just to remind you, here is a, I wonder if I can make that bigger. I think I tried that once and it didn't work. Okay, there we go. A little bit bigger. Okay, anyway, um, this is the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel 2. And it's the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet and toes of clay mingled with iron. 
And we're told that these represent empires that take over Israel. So from Daniel 2, verse 38, we're told that the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And from Daniel 5, 30 and 31, we're told the chest and arms of silver represent the Medes and the Persians that destroyed and took over Babylon and in the process controlled Israel. And then in Daniel 8, 20 and 21, we're told that the, the copper base, the brass or the uh, bronze, however you translate it, the copper based metal represents the Grecian Empire. So that starts with Alexander the Great, splits into four kingdoms. And most of Daniel 11 is all about all those kingdoms going back and forth. And then when they fall, they fall to the Romans. And in Daniel 1130, we're told that the ships of Katim come. Katim meaning is the old word for Rome, Rome and Cyprus and that area. And so the Roman iron legs. And eventually it starts out as an empire, but it splits into two legs. There's a east and a west. So that's Rome and Byzantium. And so that's why when we get down here, the feet and the toes come out of this. But Byzantium Empire um, fell in 1453. It's taken over by the Ottoman Turks, part of which went to Russia. And then the Holy Roman Empire was revived by Rome. So that's Rome is Rome. So that's fine. And so we have this going back and forth. And then in 1917 was like the final was a death blow to the empire. And so whether you believe that it's really represented by Russia, Byzantine, which is the Ottoman Empire, um, or Germany in, in Europe, either way, they were all defeated in 1917. So that's the death blow to the empire. But then in 1938 to 45, we had Hitler trying to revive the empire. You know, whether it would be centered in, in Germany or Constantinople or Russia or whatever, it doesn't matter. There was a, an attempt to revive the head and it was crushed. So 1945 at least is the end of the empire, but we have not seen the rise of the 10 nations yet. So that's what we're looking for. And I think there's a reason for that. And that's given in another prophecy. But basically, we're just looking at this. This is that. And then in chapter 7, Daniel sees beasts that represent these same things. And they're all giving us clues to this. So with that in mind, let me um, run this back down so it's back to 100%. There we go. So let's go to this. And we're going to look at starting in chapter... Um, where's my notes? Okay, hold on just a second here. And we're going to start in chapter 13. There we go. And so here is, um, and we saw this last week, but this is a different book by the same author. But again, just to see that we're doing the same stuff. So he says this, <clears throat> uh, talking about Daniel's uh, the prophecies. Therefore, br bringing the visions of Daniel into conjunction with these, we will make one narrative of the two. So chapter two with the statue and then chapter seven with the beasts and show how true and consistent these things are seen by the vision and the prophet with those of Nebuchadnezzar that he saw beforehand. So chapter two and chapter seven are different visions, but talking about the exact same thing. So the prophet speaks thus, and then he quotes, we won't read it, but he quotes Daniel seven, two to eight, we're interested in his interpretation. So here's his interpretation of these things. And this is the same as the other book last week. But it says, since these things are spoken mystically, symbolically, they, they, there's no seven-headed red dragons. They represent something. It's a mystical symbol. Since these things are spoken mystically by the prophet, they seem to be hard to understand. We will not conceal, uh, we will, shall conceal none of them from those who are possessed of a sound mind. So the first beast, namely, the lioness that comes up out of the sea. Daniel means the kingdom of the Babylonians, which is set up in the world. This is the same as the golden head or the head of gold of the image. And by speaking of wings like an eagle, he shows that Nebuchadnezzar was elevated or elevated himself rather uh, against God. And when the wings were plucked out, it means his glory was subverted. And we know the story about him 
uh, going insane. And it says that his nails grew like bird's claws and his hair like uh, like eagle's feathers, which is another symbol for another empire. But um, a lot a lot of people say he was the first biblical werewolf because he became, you know, demon possessed and whatever. But he basically went insane and he wasn't recognizable as a human. And then eventually his reason came back. And he understood God was in control. So this is what he's talking about here. That's in Daniel also. So when it says a man's heart was given to it, that's the lion. It means that he, Nebuchadnezzar, repented and acknowledged that he himself was just a man, gave glory to God. So Daniel's bear and leopard is you know, connected with the next one. So after the lioness, the prophet sees a second beast like a bear. This is denoted by the Persians, Medes and Persians. Uh, for after the Babylonians, the Persians had sovereignty. And when he said the three ribs, he talks about you know, the three ribs. And he says that uh, this is expressed by the silver that came after the gold in the image. And then it says, behold, we have explained the second beast too. The third was that of a leopard, you know, it becomes a four-headed leopard, uh, by which is meant the Greeks. For after the Persians, Alexander, the king of the Macedonians, held sovereignty and was destroyed after he destroyed Darius, so the Persians. And this is expressed by the brass of the image, brass or bronze, the copper part, okay? Speaking of the four wings of the fowl and the four heads of the beast, he shows very clearly how the kingdom of Alexander was divided into four parts or four heads, namely four kings that rose out of it. For on his deathbed, Alexander divided the kingdom into four parts. Behold, we have dis discussed these also. What's interesting to me is when you look at it, he originally planned to divide his empire into five pieces because he had five generals. And this is, in, you know, in the history. But before Alexander died, one of his generals died. And so, you know, you carve it up into the four and then they they battle each other to change the, the borders a little bit in time. So what's interesting to me with that is a lot of times when prophecy begins to happen, we look at it and say, there's five guys, there's not four. This isn't the prophecy. Well, just wait a while. You're, you'll see what happens. A lot of times we do that. So we look at the United Nations, not United Nations, but European common market, the 10 nations that came out. We figured that's the 10 toes. Well, they quickly became 27. So that doesn't quite fit. So it can't be them. Well, what if they divide, fall apart, reconstitute, and now it's 10 again? Well, maybe, maybe they were. So we have to think about this. Now, 27 is obviously not it. 10 is, five is obviously not it, four is, but it comes to pass. And so it's interesting to see that. One of the other examples of that kind of prophecy is uh, when Daniel talks about uh, the prince that should come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, Titus destroyed the city and the sanctuary, and Titus was not a prince. He was just a general, high-ranking official, but he's not a prince. So you could look at this as Titus comes in and destroys the temple and say the prophecy got it wrong. He's not a prince. He's just a guy. He's a general, but he's not royalty at all. We all know that. He knows that. Well, as a Bible believer, I'm going to say, you need to look again. Somehow he's a prince. And if you were to ask him, he'd say, no, you're wrong. I'm not a prince. Do what I tell you or I'll kill you. I'm a general, but I'm not a prince. So he would say the scriptures are wrong. Well, unbeknownst to him, Caesar had died and they didn't want any battles to happen. So they picked his father, Vespasian, to be the new Caesar. So they quietly recalled Vespasian to Rome. Vespasian didn't know if he was going to be like imprisoned or what was going on. I'm right in the middle of a battle and you want me to go, okay, you know. So it's, this is weird, you know, am I in trouble? But he goes back to Rome. Well, Titus didn't find out for months later that what had happened is right before he'd attacked and destroyed the temple, Vespasian went to Rome and was crowned emperor. 
So from that moment forward, Titus was a prince, not just a general. And so the, these are examples throughout scripture. You'd look at it, it's like, oh, no, he's not a prince. Apparently he is. Now there's five of them. There's not four. Well, wait a minute, because there will be four. Well, maybe this isn't them. No, it's them. Yeah, but there's five, not four. Well, wait a minute. So we need to take this. The more you see this, the more you're like, okay, this the scriptures are not vague. Not only are they literal, they are very, very specific. And we don't mean, you know, I, I look at these and I guess, you know, so I can have them wrong. That's just me. But they're not vague. And that's something that we really, really need to take a hold of. Anyway, side note on that. Um, so the, the next beast, the Roman beast, he says, he tells us forth uh, next that the fourth beast is dreadful and terrible with teeth of iron, claws of brass. That is meant the kingdom of the Romans, which is also meant by the iron, which will crush all the seats of the empire that will be for it. So in our studies in this, we see that Noah had a prophecy and it was written down, it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the book of Noah, about the metal kingdoms. And the metal kingdoms are identical with the metal kingdoms of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then Daniel gives us more information about them in beast form. So what we were lacking in the two, which they didn't mention, because everybody should know this, if you love Noah, you'd be reading his book. Well, we didn't have the book. So now we have that from the scrolls. Now we got more details that are explaining some of the gaps. So, but at this point, so what's interesting to me is you've got people pre-old or pre-New Testament and pre-Old Testament actually, but the scrolls saying one thing. Paul in First and Second Thessalonians, and then of course Daniel and everything else saying what they say, and then now the church fathers saying, "Hey, this is the way it's always been interpreted, always." So you've got before, during, and after the time of the New Testament, everybody agreeing on what these things mean. And that makes it pretty pretty amazing. So it's it's Rome, iron, which will crush it. Okay. So, and then load it over the whole earth. After this then, after the fall of the Roman Empire, which would be at least 1945, right? 1917 to 1945. And if the other prophecy out of the Ezra apocalypse is correct, Russia has something to do with it. So it's not done yet, which I'm in I tend to believe because of other interesting things in that particular book, but the fact that I don't see 10 nations yet. We should have seen 10 nations immediately upon 1945. Because remember, that's what happened. They redid the United Nations. That's where the United Nations came from. There was a, um, what was that called before World War II? Anyway, there was a type of United Nations, but it broke up because of the war reconstituted now it's called the united nations uh so we saw that all the different people working together and against each other and who took what side but we didn't see 10 of anything we should have if the empire was actually over the way it looks like but it looks like there's a little more to the prophecy so anyway after this then it's left for us to interpret all that the prophet saw but the toes of the image. So in other words, he's saying this is rock solid. We get to the toes. It's a bit of speculation because it hasn't happened yet. But this is our opinion, he says. The toes that were part of iron and part of clay are mingled together as one. By the ten toes of the image, he meant figuratively ten kings who sprang out of it or out of the empire. As Daniel also interpreted the matter, for he says... I considered the fourth beast, ten horns came after it, and among them is another horn like an offshoot. And it plucked up by the roots three of those that were before it. By this offshoot horn, he meant none other than the Antichrist, okay, which is to restore the kingdom of the Jews. Now, this is interesting because think about it for a minute a lot of people say that nero was the antichrist or we're talking about the destruction of israel in 70 a.d remember this is hippolytus he's writing about um 
somewhere between 190 and 210. Is that right? Or is that Tertullian? No, Hippolytus would be a little bit further. Anyway, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 AD. So this is way after 70 AD. And he's talking about these things as being future, yet future. So it's really interesting to see this. So, But he goes on and says, the three horns, which are to be rooted out, signify by these three kings, namely Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. And he gets this from Daniel chapter 11, where it says the king of the north, which is the Antichrist, comes against the king of the south, which is Egypt. And in reaction to that, Egypt, along with Libya and Sudan, or Cush, it says, which is, is Sudan or Ethiopia or some part of that territory. Right now, it's looking like it's northern Sudan because Sudan split into the two. If they split again or combine or, you know, and it's not happening this year, who knows? But Egypt has pretty much always been Egypt. Libya has pretty much always been Libya. Borders change a little, but we know who we're talking about. Kush, yeah. But anyway... But he says, since it says that, that Libya and Ethiopia or Cush side with Egypt against him and they're all wiped out. The, the king of the north wipes them all out. So he's saying because we have a prophecy of three out of the ten, we know that the Antichrist is the king of the north, the king of a country north of Israel, and he attacks Egypt and the other two and destroys them. He's assuming then, and I think it's a very good assumption, that those are the, th the same three. It's the three of the ten. So out of the ten nations, if he's correct, uh, we need to look for, at the very least, may maybe Cush is confusing, but at, at least Egypt and probably Egypt and Libya. What ten nation groups are they in? Well, right now, none that I know of. But then again, Russia is still here. And the, the empire may not have fallen. So those are speculations that we're doing that we're kind of pulling together that really make a difference when you look at some of the scrolls and put them all together. But at this point, we're just seeing how he interprets it. So again, there's a premillennial reign of, or uh, actually we are premillennial. So in other words, in the future sometime, there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ. That is going to start when he comes back. We call it the second coming. The seven years prior to that are the reign of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a demon-possessed person that is so powerful he can't be wiped out by anybody, which is why the Lord himself has to come back and destroy the Antichrist. So that's why the seven-year period is directly connected to the second coming and the millennial reign. So we understand that. And there's a real person called an Antichrist. There are two witnesses that are real people. There's a real rebuilt temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And I say Temple Mount. There's a bit of an argument on exactly where the Temple Mount really was. Whatever. It's there in Jerusalem. Okay. And so these are the things that, that uh, we can look at and kind of speculate with. But we got to be careful with. But it's interesting to see that. And then many of these guys have been pre-trib. We've seen that. So that's the basic part. But I want to share with you one other thing from this book. And it is um, in chapter 7. It's called The End Time Church. It's a description of this. Now, many of these books will have the um, descriptions about the end time church. And they're usually things about there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And there's going to be earthquakes. And there's... Yeah, we know all that, you know, and so that's that's not really the end time church. That's just end times for the planet. OK, this particular thing is different. This is talking literally about the end time church, Laodicean church. What will Laodicea, the last church age, what will the church look like prior to the second coming, prior to the rapture? What will it be like? So this is what's really interesting. This is one of my favorite prophecies. Uh, from that now he's not saying he's a prophet he got this from the holy spirit he's not saying that he was taught this by the apostles probably one or the other but he doesn't say he just says this is the way it's going to be and usually they'll say well i was taught this by the apostles if somebody's wondering about it or it's, it sounds funny but here's what he says the end time church uh, therefore, there's going to be lots of pestilence and problems and people leaving the faith. So therefore, or wherefore, what will happen? 
all shall walk after their own will. Now we're told in scriptures that, you know, and we see this a lot, people being like immodestly dressed in church. And you might say, well, you need to cover up a little bit. It's like, well, Paul talks about that. Why should my actions be based on somebody else's conscience? I think it's okay for me. So I'll dress and act the way I want to dress and act. No, you won't. Not if you're going to come to church. You can't do that. You can't be immodestly dressed and tempt people. Uh, you can you can wear jewelry, not a problem. But if I can look at your jewelry and think, wait a minute, are you Wiccan? Are you Hindu? That looks like one of those. If it's going to look like something like that, we don't want to be wearing it. If it looks like a Christian cross, I might say, you Orthodox, Roman Catholic? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. At least I know you're Christian. <laughs> But you can't confuse things. If somebody thinks that that or it looks very similar to a symbol that is occultic, you don't want to have it on your body. Not that demons are going to get you. It's a bad witness. You don't want to be risque because it's a bad witness. You don't want to, you know, anything that's, that's a bad or taboo type thing in that society, whether it's bad or not, you, you don't want to. Uh, cause a problem. And that's what's called modesty. And Paul defines it by your actions, your dress and everything being governed by other people's conscience. So I, I fellowship with Hebrew roots people, for instance, and I will tell them, I want to be completely honest. Hey, I eat bacon. I don't believe as a Gentile, I have to do any of this stuff, but I love studying the scrolls. You want to come study with me? And some of them, yeah, we just, I've been told, like, I don't understand how you can see and understand this so profoundly and yet not be one of us. It's like, well, think about it. Uh, and it doesn't matter. But what I've told him is, if you come over to my house to study, I will make sure that you don't touch anything that is non-kosher. I will not feed you something with bacon in it. I will have your back. I am a brother. Okay, I think it's stupid. I don't think it applies to you. You think it does. I want you to be comfortable so we can study and get closer to the Lord. So I, I told one of my friends, it's like, I, I, I promise if I see you pick up a Dorito chip, I will slap it out of your hand. And he's like, Doritos? Well, what Doritos? Doritos have MSG in them. MSG is derived from pork products. Technically, they're non-kosher. I mean, all, the Jews say that. And I remember him saying, really? I didn't know that. It's like, yeah, you, you can't eat Doritos. I'll eat the Doritos, but you, you can't do those. But I, open and honest. I want to be open and honest with you. We can agree to disagree. It's fine. So in this case, he says the end time church won't be like that. They won't be brothers trying to be together. Everyone walks after their own will. The children, for instance, will lay hands on their parents. A wife will give up her own husband to death. The husband will bring his own wife into judgment like a criminal. I mean, normally you want to do what's right. And if my parents or somebody is a criminal, I, I should bring them to justice. But my first reaction should be protect my family. Should I give them up? Well, I should. Well, and, and if I'm going to sin here at all, it's going to be not telling the truth. I'm protecting my family. In this case, whether that's bad or good, it seems like it's flipped. Oh, I'll be glad to get rid of so-and-so. Let's send them off. You know, that kind of stuff. I think of um, a lot of people that um, have parents that are aging and they put them in a retirement community. Some parents want to do that. Some people don't. Uh, and you need to follow whatever your parents want to do. You want to make them happy. But a lot of us are like, I can't handle them, get them out of my head, you know. And sometimes that's legitimate. Sometimes they are a danger and you can't watch them. Some grandfathers might try to molest little girls, so you can't have them in the house. There are reasons that sometimes you can't do that. But generally, you want to take care of your parents. My parents died of Alzheimer's. And I was blessed to be able to take care of them all the way up to their death. They were never in a home. 
again, there's, there's exceptions. I'm not saying everyone has to do that, but the concept is different. You get these guys, I, they, they, they did everything for me, but now I can't use them anymore. So I don't care. That's kind of what we're doing. A husband and a wife giving them up to death. You know, Jesus talks about your enemies will be of your own household. So that's what's kind of interesting. Masters will load, lord, lord, I can't talk today, it over their servants savagely. And their servants will assume an unruly demeanor toward their masters. If I hire you to work, I expect you to do the work. If you can't, I expect you to come and say, whatever reason, I can't. That's legit. Some people can't do stuff. But tell me, don't just walk away. Don't cuss me to the other employees. You know, and if I'm I'm that, I'm going to, if I'm the employee, I'm going to try to give you the best work because I want to be a good witness to the Lord. But in this case, they won't care. Um, I, I worked for a guy one time, and I remember this, it was a small electronics company. And he was saying that, okay, here's the new rule. You put in for time off, you, it has to be approved, and then you can't change it. You have to, I mean, within two weeks. If it's within two weeks, you can't change it because I have to be able to schedule. Well, that that's fine. So I put in for taking Thanksgiving off. And uh, it was like the week before Thanksgiving. He comes out and says, oh, you're working Thanksgiving. It's like, no, I can't. I have plans. No, no, you're, you're working Thanksgiving, period. I, I changed the schedule. And I said, well, what, whoa, what, what about this? We don't change the schedule for two weeks prior. You know, I can't just, you know, change stuff real quick. He said, no, that's you, not me. You will do what I tell you to do or you're fired. You understand? You be here. And I told him, I said, it doesn't work that way. I have plans with my family. And you're not paying me $9 million an hour. So you can't really command that. I want to do a good job, but you can't do it. I've told you, I can't do this. And he's like, well, then you're fired. That's all there is to it. Okay. He really expected me to come in, you know, threaten me. And I didn't. And uh, that, that really flipped him out. But what was interesting about it, because I, before, like a week or two before, he was talking about how he worked for McDonald's when he was younger. And whoever his manager was at McDonald's, I think it was McDonald's, Hardy's, one of those, but was like, no, you work when we tell you to split shift or whatever, or you're fired. You got that? And he was, and he was saying that's how mean they were to him. And he will, he'll starve first before he ever works for someone else like that. And I'm like, Hey, I can understand that. And then he comes in the next day talking about how he can't get enough people to, to work all the shifts and stuff. And he says, I need people hungry, you know, so I could do to them like what McDonald's does. I can control them. And I'm thinking like, you wouldn't work for someone like that. You recognize that it's wrong, but you're going to treat your employees like that. And it's just like, oh, this guy's weird, you know, and then he pulls that stunt with me and it's like, ah, I'm done. Uh, there, I'm not arguing, you know, I'm, I'm a good employee, but no. So, so anyway, that's, it brings back uh, different memories for me, things like that. Uh, none will reverence the gray hairs of the elderly. I mean, we're always taught or used to be taught an older person says something. It's yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They're old. They need help. You do what they tell you to do. You don't tell them they can't do something. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That doesn't happen anymore. None of them will have pity on the comeliness of youth. Somebody who's young and can't do anything. Well, then die. I don't care. It's just a weird situation. All the tenderness, the compassion are gone. Now, this is what's really interesting to me. Look at this, this part here. The temples of God. Now, what's a temple of God? I mean, that's just the wording he's used. I'm not sure who he's writing to, but churches, in other words, what places we go, uh, we could call them uh, synagogues or churches or temples or or whatever, but the churches, okay? The churches of God will be like houses. Now, he doesn't mean a house church. There's nothing wrong with a house church. He's talking about the problems. 
The churches or temples of God will be like houses. There will be overturnings of churches everywhere. Now, in some places, churches are destroyed by mobs. Uh, that That's going to happen a lot more. In the olden days, you wouldn't dare touch a church. You're going to destroy God's house? He's going to... The concept would be like, I don't want to be struck by lightning. It's not a metaphor. God could strike me by lightning. He might let me go do some sin, but fight against his kingdom? I ain't touching that with a 10-foot pole. People believed and acted like that. And now it's like, we don't care. We'll steal from a church. You want to steal from a church? Go steal from anybody else, but not a church. I mean, it's it's not the people there. We're talking about you have no fear of God. It's just weird. But that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. There'll be overturnings of churches everywhere. And not just that from the outside, but how many times do you find deacons and deaconesses that are, we will do it our way. I'll fire the pastor. I will cause a problem. They will do what I tell them to. Why would you do something like that? It's just weird. The scriptures will be despised. Another, another real quick um, thing that happened to me a long time ago, I went down to, I forget where exactly, but it was this little church. It was wanting a pastor, and I was trying out to be the pastor. And I had put in there that this is what you can expect from me in my resume, that I will do this, this, this. I will be teaching prophecy. I will be here, and I will, you know, you can expect this from me. I will be. And then I had another section that this is what I expect from the church. I want you to be serious about scriptures, follow scriptures, respect God-ordained authority. And I had scriptures for each one of them. And the one with the God-ordained authority, it was, the, I forget exactly where, I think it was a quote out of um, Hebrews 13 about, you know, this kind of stuff. And so basically, uh, in my mind, it's like if you hire a pastor, you need to follow the lead of the pastor. If you know better than the pastor fire him and you be the pastor. And th this is a problem with certain denominations. A lot of deacons are like that. Anyway, so I had that on my resume and I'm sitting in front of this council and they're asking me questions and all. And this one deacon, it, I guess they had had a pastor that had stole something and then took off or something. And so he said, well, one thing I would tell you is to take that scripture, that part out of your resume, because nobody's going to hire you if they think you're trying to take over. I don't consider a pastor my boss, and I don't like anybody trying to tell me they're my boss, you know, this kind of thing. And so you better take that off your resume. You're never going to get anywhere. And so he, he said that, and I, I, I'm like, okay. And I said, well, I have a question about that. What do you think it's referring to in Hebrews 13? I mean, if you're thinking it's talking about secular government, I could see that, you know, so I'm just, for reference here, why would you not want that in there? Does it not apply? So I'm just asking. And so he he says something that I've never forgot. He said, I don't know and I don't care. I'm telling you, take that off of there. You will never set foot in a church one of, you know, with that kind of an attitude. And I I was flabbergasted. It's like, really? Okay. So I told him, I said, okay, well, let me just say one more thing. You and I can agree. And maybe you're right. I mean, if it's referring to secular government, then I'm wrong and probably should change that. And I will look at it later. But when I hear a deacon say, uh, what do you think the scripture says? And the deacon says, I don't know and I don't care, but it will be my way. If I was pastor, the first thing I would do is you would be excommunicated. I mean, I'm sure you didn't mean it that way, but you can't even say something like that. There is a problem that needs to be dealt with. And of course, needless to say, I didn't become the pastor of that church. But that that surprised me. I don't know and I don't care. You don't know and you don't care. That just, okay. Anyway, enough said. But the scriptures will be despised. thought that was interesting. And everywhere they will sing songs of the adversary. Now, I've always wondered what this meant. Uh, I, I've never been in a church where they're singing Hail Satan or anything like that. What does it mean to sing the songs of the adversary? Well, we have a lot of problems today in the contemplative prayer movement. 
And that's the idea that instead of praying an intelligent prayer, you just repeat a phrase over and over. You know, like the Hindus will, will go like this and go, om, you know, repeat a phrase over and over again. Some of these other people might just say Jesus, Jesus, or, or a scripture or a name, God, you know, bless me or whatever, or praise God, praise God, praise God. Any kind of a repeated thing. And anciently, any kind of a repeated phrase makes you zone out and it's called sorcery. It's supposed to open your mind up to the spiritual world and we're not supposed to do that. So the Christian version of sorcery is contemplative prayer. It doesn't mean you can't sing a song that's repetitive. Songs are supposed to be repetitive. That's the chorus, you know. I'm not talking about a chorus. I'm talking about the specific concept of meditative uh, trances, prayer, whatever you want to call them, but that kind of thing. And in Revelation, it talks about outside, you know, in the end times, the church will not repent of its sorceries. And again, I never, I never walk into a church where they're trying to conjure up a demon or something like that. But singing the songs of the adversary or in that manner, I think that's what we're talking about. Now, notice this. It says fornications, adulteries, and perjuries will fill the land. Sorceries, incantations, and divinations will follow after these with all force and zeal. Now we look at this and, and wonder, but Irenaeus, one of the other church fathers, talks about how they don't say prayers for the dead or pray to the dead. They don't call down an angel or call up a demon or any other kind of wicked, curious art. So some of those things might work, but he's saying we don't call forth angels. We don't pray to angels or saints. We don't call up demons. It, it, some of that sounds bad. Some of it sounds good. That's not what a Christian does. A Christian prays to God and to God alone. And it doesn't, he gives no thought to the, the shape of the hands or the, the body positions or none of that matters. This is a relationship between you and God. Father, I need some help. What do you want me to do? I mean, you can do it this way. You can do it. That doesn't matter. Just be honest. Talk to the Father. Talk to God. But incantations, divinations, and things like that will follow with all force and zeal. Trying to figure out what God wants you to do by looking at a cloud or looking at your horoscope or something like that. And some of us will laugh at that, but I've had people do that, actually. Um, let's see here. So look at this. Um, and on a whole, generally speaking, from among those who profess to be Christians. So inside the church, people that will say, no, no, I, I'm a Christian, been Christian a long time. I am a hardcore Christian. From among those who profess to be Christians, and of course profess, I'm assuming he's saying they're not really Christians. They may think they are, they may be con artists, but as far as you and I would know, at first they seem Christian, they profess to be a Christian. From that crowd of people in your church will arise then false prophets, false apostles, imposters, mischief makers, evildoers, liars against one another, adulterers, fornicators, robbers, grasping. I think that's, you know, not stealing a physical object, but trying to control perjury. Okay. Hating one another. So it's interesting to me if, if, if you're a prophet and you come and tell me something, we should be brothers. I'm not a prophet, but I should be able to look at you and go, oh man, th this is great. Thank you. Um, I should be respectful either way. But for you to be a liar, adulterer, a fornicator, you know, the prophet comes to give me a word of the Lord and all of a sudden my money's gone. Where did it go? You know, it's just, it's just weird. And you'll have stuff like that. And I know people that claim to be prophets that have done things like that. We'll talk about a pro, a pro, a false apostles and stuff some other time. Next week, I want to look at a, a, a church father stuff that describes that in general. Um, okay, so the shepherds will be like wolves. The priests will embrace falsehood. The monks will lust after the things of the world. The rich will assume a hardness of heart. The rulers will not help the poor. 
The powerful will cast off all pity. Judges will remove justice from the land and the and be blinded with bribes and they will call it or and they will call in unrighteousness. And he goes on and talks about other things too. But I think this is interesting this whole concept. This is going to be in the church too. And this is not what brothers do to brothers. Once one uh, one of these other things in here actually says that one of the prophecies would be in the midst of this kind of stuff there would be much contention about his coming. And I think it's interesting. I can say, I think uh, the Gog Magog war is uh, at the end of the tribulation or is coming soon or whatever. I know some Christians that say the, uh, the Psalm 83 war is yet future and, or it's happened in the past or it's not really a prophecy. And there's all sorts of different ideas and nobody really tries to kill anybody about it. I mean, it's just their opinion. But somehow when you get to a pre-mid or a post-trib rapture, everybody's, you know, trying to kill everybody, basically. They're very, very hostile. I don't actually know any pre-tribbers that if you were to talk to a post-tribber or a mid-tribber, that would be very um, mean-spirited. I think most of us would say, I don't believe that and walk away. And we're confident because the scriptures are pretty clear. The scrolls are pretty clear. The church fathers are pretty clear. Everything's pretty clear. Maybe I am wrong. It does nothing to do with salvation. So, eh. but I do know several people that are post-trib that are extremely um, hostile. I can think of one guy I'm thinking of. Uh, Andy Woods wrote a, a book or wrote on. The idea of um, um, in Second Thessalonians two, where it talks about an apostasy comes first, and then the tribulation. He was saying that it's possible this could be translated rapture, apostasy, a catching away, a removal, and maybe it is, maybe it's not. But he was speculating maybe this means this. And I remember this one guy who's post tribber. He got irate, and he put out a forty minute YouTube video on how stupid Andy Woods was and the people that agree with that, talking about how um, a first-year Greek student would know better than to translate it like that. It can't be translated like that because, blah, you know, this kind of stuff. And, I mean, he was just... But I thought, well, I'm going to watch the whole thing all the way through the 40 minutes because if it can't be translated like that, I would like to know why. Or even if he just thinks it is, he might have a good reason why you can't translate it that way so i'm listening to this thing and i listen to it for 40 minutes he never once says anything about greek other than a first century student would know better i mean a first first year greek student would know better it's like okay i guess i don't know better but anyway maybe i've forgotten what is it 40 minutes and he didn't tell us anything he didn't give us the reason why that's but he was extremely mad extremely hostile and I think it's interesting how we've got people like that. They will try to goad you, you know, like, well, I don't think your doctorate's legit. I don't think that you, did you have a stroke recently or something? What's wrong with you? And they try to goad you into doing stuff. And, uh, you know, things like that happen in a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, especially if you're talking about cults. Sometimes cults will do that. It's like, would you come on and debate me on this? Yeah, not really. Um, but when it comes to prophecy, very few people will be hostile on any prophetic deal. They might think, oh, you're goofy, you know, but they're not hostile. But when it comes to somehow the pre-trib rapture, post-trib, the rapture in general, timing, these guys get very unchristian. I want to share with you one thing, and, and, and this is important uh, for this kind of thing. This is Paul in Titus, Titus 3.10. He, Paul says this, a man that is a heretic after the first or second admonition or warning, reject. And that means eject, like kick him out of the church. Knowing that he is, that such, a person like that is subverted, sins being self-condemned. Now we look at this and think, okay, what is a heretic? Somebody doesn't believe in Jesus. Um, it's not a particular doctrine. 
like you and I can argue over the gifts of the spirit or that's interesting. I wonder how that got in there. Anyway, we'll get to questions in a minute, but uh, we can argue over stuff like that or not argue, but debate. But what is a heretic per se? Let me flip over. This is King James. I'll flip over just for a second to ISV and read it. And in ISV, it says, have nothing to do with a divisive person. Heretic really means someone who wants to argue and like split a church, that kind of a thing. Uh, don't have anything to do with a divisive person after you have warned him once or twice. I mean, once ought to be enough, but to make sure that we understand it's not a, a, that subject you were talking about the other day. It's this continuing attitude of hostility. For you know such a person like this is corrupt, keeps on sinning, and is self-condemned. So the divisive person is what we're talking about. So in the King James, we're talking about a man that is divisive, causing divisions, a heretic, should be warned and then removed. You don't continue to debate with him. You don't continue to do anything as long as he's hostile. He has to admit that not what he's saying, but the way he's saying it is sin. So if you and I debate on a pre-trib rapture or whether somebody's a cult or whatever, I'm going to give evidence that it's this way. You're going to give evidence that's that way. And we're going to let people judge. And that's the way that it works. Okay. But for me to become extremely angry, cuss you out, something like that, that's not appropriate. That's not, that's something that we cannot allow. Another place in, in Corinthians, Paul talks about people that are weak in the faith. They don't understand the scriptures. Don't forbid them to come to church because everybody's wrong somewhere and needs to learn. We all need to get together. So allow them to come to church, but not for the purpose of debating or dividing. So, and I, I think of Hebrew roots people because they were talking about the, the concept of, you know, whether they can or can I eat certain things or whatever. So like my Hebrew roots friends, you're welcome to come study with me. I don't think you need to do that, but I will make sure you don't eat anything that you don't think you should eat. I, I'm your brother. I want to help. But I'm also honest. I want you to know I'm, I'm going to go eat bacon after you leave. Just, just saying, you know, want to be honest. We're not going to get anywhere if we're not honest and we don't treat each other like brothers. But if I was hostile and said that you're an idiot and you're sinning, you got to, you know, that's unacceptable. So even if you're right and I'm totally wrong, if you're hostile like that, you're sinning, you're subverted. And after the first warning, you're to be ignored or rejected until you st straighten up and start doing things right. So 1 Corinthians 1 through 3 about the divisions, uh, uh, Titus 3.10 after the second, first or second warning of Jack. So that's what we're talking about here. So it's interesting that we'll have this concept. Always, always, always remember, like it says in Galatians 6, it could just as easily be you that got mad and did something wrong, whatever it is. But the concept is we don't excommunicate people for doctrines, for thinking, I, I'm, I understand the Trinity concept, but I just can't wrap my head around it. Okay, that's fine. Understand that that's the official teaching. Don't come against it. We'll try to talk about it sometime. I can't wrap my head around how the gifts would stop or how they would continue or about the rapture. Okay, that's fine. It's, it's, it's important and we need to study it, but yeah, tell us. So we'll, we'll tackle that next instead of something else we all agree on. We're brothers in the Lord. We're going to come together, but we can't be evildoers, liars against one another, adulterers, fornicators, robbers, things like that. Among those who profess to be Christians, and I'm going to say this is inside of a church somewhere, and these guys are not Christian. You know, and I've known a lot of people that are actually the good, solid Christians have kids. The kids are raised up in the church and they fall away. Now, granted, if they only come to church for an hour or two a week and they go to a public school system and they're taught junk 40 hours a week, obviously, who's going to win? 
you know, and so uh, not that it's necessarily wrong to send somebody to a, pro to a public school, but you've got to know what's going on or you're going to lose your kids. The Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the fact that you don't mix with the pagans. Even if they're happy-go-lucky, it causes problems. Your son and daughters are going to end up wanting to date some of these people. And if you allow that, it's going to be disastrous, you know, or you, you get them ready by explaining, this is what the world teaches. This is why they say we're weird. Here are the answers. Look at it. Try the experiment. Do it yourself. And then when they go to college and they're told Christians are stupid because they believe this, it's like, wow. And I thought you were a professor. You don't understand. Wow. Okay. Whatever. You want them to have that reaction, not, oh my gosh, Christians are weird. I've never heard that before. They need to be prepared. It's really important. So, and not, not just our kids, but everybody. Our, we need to make sure we understand this. I had a friend that told me one time that we had, or he had a guy get saved, come to church, got saved, and they, they ran him through a new believers course and started doing some other stuff. And he was in the military. Okay. So he was there. He was, he was going to be locked in solid. It was a good church and everything, but he was only there about a month or so. And he had been shipped off somewhere else. You know, he's military. You got to follow wherever you're going. So he takes off and, and goes. And so years later, someone uh, had ran across him and contacted him or whatever and was telling the church what had happened. He now is in a Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall. And so you're thinking like, well, what happened? Well, he wasn't grounded. Well, he was only there a month and a half. Well, that should have been enough to ground him if you were super you know, but we assume, well, he'll be here forever. He'll pick it up along the line. Yeah, he would have. But you never know if something's going to happen tomorrow that you're going to be shipped off or something's going to happen. We need to try to prepare now as best as we can, not overload. But it's really, really important. And I'm rattling on too much, but I wanted to share this with you. This is one of my favorite things about the end time church, the idea of all these things happening. So let's stop there for now.